Hello. Ten years ago, Clive Barker was touring his fringe theatre group around Europe in between spells on the dole. Now, he's recognised as one of the leading horror and fantasy writers with titles such as Weave World, The Great and Secret Show, and Imagica becoming huge international bestsellers. Since he directed the cult classic Hellraiser, Barker has made a series of successful films based on his novels and short stories, and has recently made his home in Hollywood. In tonight's programme, we look at Barker's controversial literary journey into the darker reaches of human experience. we've seen Hellraiser, when we've looked at some of the books, we do sit and wonder from where he got this quality. Uh, I think we're still at a loss as to know who to blame. <laughs> um, because it's so alien to both of us. We, we couldn't approach anything no, like that, could no we, no in, in no putting that down on paper. No. The artist's side, I can understand mm. the drawing. Although, once again, his drawing is not the sort of thing that I would want too much hanging on my wall. No. It doesn't get it from me, and I don't think it gets it from his dad. Big and black the clouds may be, time will pass away. If you put your trust in me, I'll make bright your day. Liverpool in the 50s was not the most stimulating of cities. I lived in very conventional, rather reassuring circumstances, but feeling that my imagination was pushing me into areas of, of darkness and anxiety, unease, and also into areas where, uh, where those very conventional elements, where those very reassuring elements were just blown away. Doors opened within those environments and Things came through those doors. I mean, that was very much what was going on in my imagination. Open up your eyes now. Tell me what you see. It is no surprise now. What you see is me. But Clive was, had his own room, so he could do all his work up there. And providing he kept all that mess in there, then I had to let that go. Sometimes I despaired, I must be honest, but but no, he had his own place and what he did there was his was up to him. It was the place where I wrote, it was the place where I drew, it was the place where I imagined. I was very secretive, I've always been fairly secretive. I needed to feel as though what I was doing was uh, uh, almost had the feel of uh, a dark, perhaps slightly forbidden process. At 11, Clive Barker went to Liverpool's Quarrybank School, where his art teacher was Alan Plant. He had a wall around him that was built by his own enthusiasm and talent, 
and uh, the fact that he was so grown up. It wasn't like talking to a boy. Uh, he didn't tell jokes, you know, or, or act the fool. All his energies were devoted to being uh, an entertaining, serious artist. And uh, there's very few boys like that, actually. There was a guy with a, uh, a noose around his neck, uh, and one of those fake hands with the hairy warts on the back of it. And he was being led around the school from uh, class to class by this guy, whom I later discovered to be Clive Barker. And he was uh, doing a tour of the school to advertise uh, um, a play that he had written, was directing, starring in. He was doing Salome. And of course, this meant a decapitated head. And Clive must have spent a long time making this head. It was absolutely wonderful. And it was as gory as you could possibly get. But it wasn't just the fact that here we have a gory head on a plate. It was the way it was delivered to us in his long silken gown, you see, which he preferred, I think. Um, he came to the front row and raised the head at us with a dramatic gesture and frightened the life out of the lot of us because the, the sort of entrails of the head fell down from underneath. You know? I think he was the catalyst for good or evil. I mean, the, the fact that he pulled all these people together was one thing. I'm not sure all the parents were always happy with what they did and where they finally... They weren't, were they? I think there were always fellow students and the parents of fellow students and occasionally uh, members of staff who would say, whatever's, you know, going on in Barker's head, we should get into a therapist very soon. He, he couldn't allow people to sort of talk him down or condemn what he was doing. And in the end, because of this attitude which kept people out there, and you either agreed with Clive or you stayed away and, you know, you either went to the gates of hell with him or you kept your place and stayed out there. He was not to be interrupted in his journey. And, of course, quite a lot of people and quite a lot of parents were quite worried that he might take some of their children along with him. You know, you grow up in, in a working-class situation in, in a depressed industrial town like Liverpool, and one always thought that the artistic life was something that other people did. And Clive was very good at, without sort of lecturing or, or trying to make cod speeches about doing this stuff, he simply seemed to offer an example that, well, my God, actually, you, you can do this. You know, it's just up to you. If you want to try this, there aren't any rules. You don't have to pass an exam. You can just start doing theatre, you can start making movies, you can start writing, you can start drawing, painting, whatever. When he was 19, Barker and his friends decided to make an 8mm film based on the story of Salome. We scraped together money, we put the stuff on black and white, the stuff was developed in a bathtub. I mean, it was very, very low grade, if you will. Uh, as far as the, the technological uh, aspects of it were concerned, but it was done with passion, and it was done with, um, with no rules. ourselves pretty much as Warhol's factory on Merseyside you know there was a period of time when we were all sharing a house together and there were you know little bits of creativity going on and various uh, ways and we we developed something of a reputation for ourselves as being a little weird mm -hmm. After leaving university, Barker spent the next ten years on the dole, touring with his fringe theatre group, The Dog Company. I mean, we were a completely unknown company, uh, consisting of entirely unknown actors, producing entirely unknown plays by an entirely unknown playwright. <laughs> it was a winner. <laughs> it was a hard sell a lot of the time. <laughs> In 
Yeah, when I did Frankenstein, um, I had to get um, cling film on first, carbon body cling film. It was an extraordinary creation, actually. It looked brilliant. And that, that was the thing that actually um, made people faint up in Edinburgh. I think mm. it was the scariest of the... Certainly in Edinburgh, we hardly did, had to do any publicity. Word of mouth spread round and the show just was sold out every night. Tomorrow I'll recant. They'll break your fingers. Let them. Tell them a story, like I do. About what? I tell them we eat babies, drink piss. I tell them we watch corpses raped by dogs. We shit on the host. I tell them a goat with a prick of hot iron comes out of the trees and we'll kiss its rump by the light of living children buried in excrement up to their necks with their heads on fire. Word. They cross themselves with every new abomination and thank the Lord for bringing this poor monster into the light of his redemption. I mean, I think we rather naively thought that all we had to do was present this extraordinary work to the public who would go, wow, this is amazing. And when the critics didn't do that, uh, I mean, we would have many a dark morning of the soul poring over these reviews. And, uh, but, but Clive's attitude then was not, what are we doing wrong? Uh, or what was he doing wrong? He would always be asking the question, why aren't they getting it? Why can't they see it? Mm. Uh, and, and that, I mean, he, he always had unshakable belief in what he was doing. There was a, a great closeness because we had very few um, uh, tools uh, beyond our imaginations. A lot of theory was spoken, a lot of Passions were exchanged. There was a lot of anger, a lot of disappointment, a lot of frustration, but there was also uh, a lot of wonderful creativity. Clive certainly was, was the boiler house of the company. I mean, he was involved in every single aspect. Uh, he was writing the plays. He was directing the plays. Uh, initially, he was also acting in them as well, but then he, he stepped out of that. He wasn't any good as an actor. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he would... He would say that. <laughs> it was know. very good that he'd stopped acting, I think. <laughs> the Dog Theatre Company toured extensively throughout Europe and the UK. In 1975, Barker made a second film based on the Faust legend. Out of uh, a desire to make this movie on a very, very modest budget, probably in the, in the hundreds of pounds, uh, nevertheless evoke the presence of transcendental beings, we decided we'd, we'd shoot the whole thing in negative. Uh, I loved, still love, white shadows and uh, uh, the sense that literally the rules of the world have been inverted. played the central Faustian character who's graphically skinned in the film. And the same sort of arrogant assumption that we could make world-class theater on no money, we decided we could probably make world-class cinema on no money too. We got 600 quid from um, Merseyside Arts, basically to buy film stock. And we spent a long time trying to make The Forbidden. Um, two years worth of filming, I think. For most people, being involved with a, a theatre company would be a full-time job. But um, Clive was always involved in something else as well. I mean, he was uh, endlessly being surprised by another batch of short stories, or he'd been painting away at something, or making sculptures of the devil, or whatever it was going to be. My theatre agent uh, took, uh, I think, five short stories. Uh, which I had written for my own entertainment. I mean, they were dark, strange little tales, and I, I don't know really even if I'd even thought they were fit for public consumption. I knew they were fit for the consumption of my friends, but I don't, don't think I was really, I don't think I ever thought, well, I shall publish these. 
But when Barker did publish the first of his short stories in 1984, they were an immediate success. The Books of Blood, as they were called, eventually ran to six volumes. Perhaps they would remember her, as he had said they might, finding her cracked skull in tomorrow's ashes. Perhaps she might become in time a story with which to frighten children. She had lied, saying she left. The circling undertow snatched at him immediately. He barely had time to draw breath before he was sucked beneath the surface and dragged round and round, down and down. He felt himself buffeted again. On the lower bunk lay a dark, wretched shape, still solidifying as Cleve watched, knitting itself together from the shadows. There was something of a rabid fox in its incandescent eyes, in its arsenal of needle teeth, something of an upturned insect, her features dissolved, becoming the red sea he dreamt of, and washing up over his face that was itself dissolving, common waters of thought and bone. One of those stories Rawhead Rex was made into a film, Ugh. which you didn't like. Ugh. And so, was, was it a result of that that you made the film Hellraiser? I was appalled by the film stuff that had come previous to Hellraiser. I, there's a movie called uh, Under, Underworld. I can barely get the word out, you see. And, and Rawhead Rex. And I disliked both of them fiercely. <laughs> read enough about the way that movies work to realize that very possibly if I remained a writer I would never see a movie that I liked from my work. Um, so I thought, well, I can't do any worse than these movies. I might, do not, I might not do significantly better, but I, I really don't think I can do any worse. And I sat down with some friends and uh, we calculated what we could get for a million dollars. You know, a modest number of actors and a modest number of special effects. And I had written a novella called The Hellbound Heart, and we agreed that this was not a bad start. Uh, so I turned that into a screenplay, uh, and we hiked it around England first, hoping we would find the, the, you know, the, the money we needed here. Came close on a couple of occasions, but nobody wanted to take the risk. The high old days of Hammer films have long since passed. Uh, so we went over to America, where we really didn't have any contacts, uh, and talked our way into a lot of offices. And uh, we signed what, in retrospect, is the sucker's deal, you know, because we signed our lives away. And So you didn't make much from those? <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not. Halfway through the, the shooting of the picture, um, uh, the people from New World who'd been getting the dailies um, in Los Angeles, so this is all shot in, you know, in, uh, in North London, house in Dollis Hill. Uh, you know, L.A. was getting the Dollis Hill dailies. And they started to look at this stuff, and they thought, oh, actually, there's something going on here. There's, we're spending this million dollars, and we thought it was sort of straight to video, but actually, there's something going on here. became a minor phenomenon in the sense that this character, Pinhead, um, caught the public imagination, the image, the performance, the tone, something about it. And he became a, a kind of icon. You solved the box. We came. Now you must come with us. Taste our pleasures. Well, Pin Pinhead, as we meet him in the first film, is a demon from hell, and he has control over this puzzle box, the lament configuration. 
this opens up uh, the gateway to a world of pain and pleasure, but it's a Faustian kind of idea of uh, gain the world, lose your soul. It is a stunning image. There would be a way of presenting this image, which is basically a guy with a lot of nails banged into his head that would just be a bloody mess and would be a visual turn-off, and you would just go, oh, I, I don't want to see that. The reaction I always get from people the first time they see me with the makeup on is they go, wow. Jesus Christ! Not quite. It's hard to look back now and realise the impact that Hellraiser had at the time. My own responses to the scene in which Frank emerged from the floorboards or the first scene in which the Cenobites appear were ones of complete dread. And I think that this was something that hadn't been seen before, literally. And I think this is part of Barker's project. It is a sense in getting away from the old notion that what is implied is much more powerful than what is seen. He clearly is looking for the revelation response here. He wants you to see those big moments. He doesn't want them happening off screen. He wants them to be center stage like a Grand Guignol spectacle. Uh, I don't think Clive is like any other director I've ever worked with. There's, uh, he's got a vision that's clear. He's, he grabs onto an idea and he knows what he wants. When we first met on Hellraiser 1, we went for the most fluid, disgusting stuff we could come up with, and that was great. Um, we used a lot of animation in there, reverse animation, so we were destroying the creature. We were literally melting it down with huge, great um, heaters, and the wax would run off, and we'd pull strings and wires and cables out of the wax. So in reverse, these would look like veins that would crawl in and the flesh would crawl over them. There's a sort of strange thought out there that somehow what we do is, is evil and, and wrong. But I have to disagree with it because I think what we're doing is just tapping into the feelings and the sense that's in everyone. I think people can't accept that this outer shell is only the outer shell. It's just the layer that we happen to see. All the bits inside are us as well. And why that revolves people, I still don't know. But, uh, you know, it does. <laughs> The fish hooks, I think, is one of the most sort of shocking of images from the film. Uh, it's kind of, it's almost a religious, I don't know why, but it's a sort of the hook's flesh and then the sort of the pulling you out into the crucifixion. Um, I know that that comes from the Philippines and that, that people really do that, for real. So it's a kind of a strange, bizarre link to reality. I don't know if that sits in the back of people's mind, that's what makes it disturbing. <laughs> I've never been terribly interested in going to a movie and coming out and saying, hmm, you know, uh, let's go get a pizza. I mean, I want to feel something, and, and I don't mind if that feeling once in a while, not all the time, but once in a while is one of disgust. <laughs> to have access to the darkness as it is to the images of transcendence. And I think one of the things that we do in our culture is marginalize the stuff we don't really want to know about. Uh, and by doing that, curiously, maybe empower it in a bad way so that it erupts in strange fashions. <laughs> One of the things I'm constantly trying to say is let the recognition of the possibility of transcendence or the possibility of bodily corruption be something that is daily part of just getting on with existence. Hellraiser was one of the most successful independent films of the 80s, and Barker went on to direct Nightbreed, which he adapted from his novel Cabal. In Nightbreed in particular, the monsters are the heroes. The monsters are at the center of the narrative. They are clearly quite appealing. 
glamorous, extraordinary, and there's a, an amazing variety to them. And I think that the whole point here for Barker is that the monsters are actually the good guys. And this was the problem that the production company, Morgan Creek, had with it. When he delivered it to them, they said, Clive, you know, our problem with this is the, the monsters are the good guys. And Barker's response, obviously, was, well, that's actually the whole point. <laughs> Clive's basic idea for Nightbreed was he wanted to create a world of monsters. All the way through the shoot, we'd still come up with creatures, and we'd invent creatures and create creatures. I think we created, like, 300 creatures in the end. It was a very interesting process to make that many and still keep coming up with the ideas. A lot of the time, you can build things that just aren't going to make it onto the screen. And I'm afraid this little friend here is an example. And rightly, I think, Clive decided that this was too much. Um, there are limits. And this is probably one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Clive Barker has now made his home in Hollywood, where he's become a successful film producer, with Hellraiser 4 and Candyman 2 currently in production. But as so often with Hollywood, compromises have to be made. Thief of Always, the children's book I did last year, we're doing as an animated feature for, for uh, Paramount. Now, particularly in the area of animation, your control as a producer is minuscule. I mean, I've written the screenplay, but somebody somewhere else is going to be doing the drawings. I mean, you, you, you can't even have a hand in the casting. <laughs> I was comparing Al Lulu for the animated uh, series. I mean, Here, this, Barker this discusses point. with Topa Taylor, co-producer of The Thief of Always, how the character should look on the screen. I mean, what is something significant has happened here? We've moved out of sort of a uh, sort of Alice in Wonderland right. area into Winona Ryder, the age That's of right. ten. That's right. Yeah, I have mixed feelings about that. This is the Lulu from the book, and he is Lulu from the movie. I mean, this she's <laughs> she looks like sure here. Something like this is uh, perhaps a little more accessible to a mainstream audience. I think the book design is uh, slightly inaccessible to uh, some people. To a modern American audience of nine-year-olds. Yeah, that's right. Not only, not only nine-year-olds, but perhaps to their parents or to the religious right, etc. Do you think they're... Uh... Well, actually, I think the religious right would have more problem with the girl who's just dressed in a sweater and is covered in lizards. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. It's important to have the darkness as long as there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I think what's being lost in the debate at the moment is that you, you can't scrub the picture completely clean. You can't make it all saccharine, because if you do, you start to lie to kids. <laughs> Behind me, Los Angeles at night, laid out like a carpet, or uh, the opening shot from Blade Runner. This is in some ways a very trivial city, a very superficial city. It's quite in love with the surface of things, and maybe sometimes neglects its heart and its spirit. But it does have many casual enchantments. The site behind me has to be one of the most beautiful, sites of any city that I know. L.A. has many strange responses to the business of the flesh. Uh, it's a place where people tan over their diseases. It's a place where people uh, have incredible pieces of surgery done to their bodies to reshape them. And it's a place where people work out relentlessly, sweat their bodies to rack and ruin in order to be beautiful. It's a place which uh, worships the flesh in every form, and boy, I feel at home here. But we're a little way, just uh, a few yards from my favorite store in the city, the soap plant, which sells, as we will see, an extraordinary collection of books and items which 
sort of represent many of the preoccupations that brought me to the city in the first place. We've got Timothy Leary here on visions and drugs. We've got a book here on uh, f drugs that make you smarter. That's a big subject at the moment. Uh, and one which I'm uh, kind of interested in. I'm getting to the age when I really want to be taking some smart drugs. We've got books of erotic art, ha hardcore erotic art, books of grotesquerie. This is rather wonderful. An extraordinary painter of profoundly grotesque images uh, rendered with obsessive detail. I guess this is my favorite aisle. We have uh, Giga here, of course, the man who uh, designed the alien from uh, the movie of the same name. An extraordinary guy who's uh, a pal of mine and a, an influence upon me. Mr. Ripley, there you go, a compendium of curiosities from the Believe It or Not archives. On this, this side, we have James Dean, Dennis Hopper, Malcolm X. Portrait glamour, there you go. Portrait glamour on the one side, the wonderful Bette Davis. And on the other, some uh, Joel Peter Witkin. I don't know how familiar people are with uh, Mr. Witkin's images, but magnificently dark and depraved images. This is a city which seems to thrive on contrasts, thrive on horrors and beauty side by side. Sometimes walking through the city is like walking through a Fellini movie. This is an environment I suppose I've always dreamed about having. Uh, this wing of the house I had built for, for this purpose. Uh, I have never had as comfortable a place to write as this, never been as happy in a writing environment as I am here. Uh, but I suppose it's taken 25 years to, to get to this. I have to work rigorously, pretty much office hours. That means, in a sense, you can't indulge the, the artist notion. You just have to get on with it. There's no such thing as a potential writer that's just a guy who writes, you know? At the moment, I'm working on a 600, 700-page novel, Everville. And uh, that means that I, I am very structured, very rigorous, and won't even read back over what I've written until I get to the end of each draft. I'll write three handwritten drafts, usually, which in the case of Everville here will be um, 9,000 handwritten pages, I suppose, something in that region. I keep a notebook beside the bed, so I keep a what roughly might be called a dream journal. So dreams are very important, and so are daydreams. I mean, you know, in a sense, what am I doing for 10 hours a day when I'm writing a novel, but, you know, dreaming with my eyes open? I mean, that's the whole business of, 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 of writing this kind of material, I think, is that you are plunging into, um, plunging down through layers of your consciousness into hopefully fairly primal areas. Looking back, was there some sort of pattern to your, to your reading, to your voluntary reading when you were I a boy? I think there was, and I think a lot of it was based upon... I don't think I grasped a lot of what I was reading. I grasped the, the, the parts that I needed, if you will. And I suppose Blake was a revelation, because here was talk of Camden Town and Marlebon and angels and demons all in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. And what attracted you about that juxtaposition? It was the juxtaposition that attracted you. It sort was, of, again, a sort of parallel world. There it is. Angels hovering and... Well, it isn't even a parallel the world. The London streets going. Yes, he's, he's not even saying it's two worlds. No. He's saying it's just one oh, world. Yeah. And, and that was the revelation to me that previously I'd lived, if you will, the sort of C.S. Lewis vision, which is that you open the wardrobe and you step through the wardrobe and Narnia's on the other side. What Blake says is Narnia's here. What Blake says is the, the metaphysical life, the life of angels and mm. demons, occupies the same streets that we are walking and breathing and living in. The other thing, of course, to say is that, that at the same time, you start to realize that with Wells, with Shelley, uh, Mary now, Mary uh, with Stoker, with Stevenson, with Tolkien, with C.S. Lewis, that many of the great works of fantasy, science fiction, horror fiction uh, were written, you know, by, by Brits. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I suppose it wasn't until I got to university that I realized how condescending people could be about this kind of fiction. Uh, just because we turn 16 and become embarrassed by asking the questions doesn't mean we don't still continue to say, why am I here? Who put me here? What's it worth? Is there a God? All of those questions, uh, which remain every bit as legitimate at the age of 41 as they did when I ceased asking them out of embarrassment when I went to university, because I suppose the vocabulary, you know, I, I studied philosophy at university for a period, and linguistic philosophy was still very much a, a legitimate source of, 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 of endeavor, and I really wasn't interested in that. I wasn't interested in studying semantics as a means to, to knowing why I was on the planet. Mm. I wanted to ask the questions Blake asked. Actually, I wanted to give the answers Blake gave. <laughs> and, and so I think that's what touches the fans. I think it's the sense that uh, I'm saying uh, we live in a world full of these unseen powers. And um, don't be uh, shy about allowing your imagination to open to that possibility, even if it's only in the pages of a book. These metaphysical and fantastical themes explored in Barker's epic novels such as Weave World, The Great and Secret Show, and Imagica have broadened his appeal, drawing him away from the horror fiction which first established his reputation. <laughs> no attention. Yeah, we had no damage at all. I'm quite into the occult myself, and I find it's very accurate. I don't know whether he does a lot of occult research or anything, but it's it's kind of very, it's very true. It really rings true to me. Jay and Clive. Okay. Thanks, Thanks guys. Have a great one. Yeah. The female characters are really strong, and I find that's that's unusual with um, a male author. I don't know if you remember, I've made you a pinhead fridge magnet. I still have it. I've made you a novel. I still have it, absolutely. Rawhead Rex fridge magnet. It also glows in the dark. It's a Rawhead Rex fridge magnet. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And it glows in the dark? The teeth do. And they just deal so much more to me with the more sort of intrinsic, basic thing of, of life, inevitable death, and what it is to be human, the predicament we're in. And he addresses that very, very powerfully. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Felicity. Felicity. We got it. <laughs> His concept of the sort of demons from hell is like the complete opposite. It's like um, it's very cold and sort of clinical and um, whereas it's not it's not chaotic, it's the opposite, it's all discipline and um, order and, and I just like it's the way he's, he's turned everything around, that whole idea of what the uh, usual concept of, of hell is. <laughs> I love it. That's actually a really good one, Danny. It's a really good one. It's so cool. Thanks, Danny. Great. I did get some very strange looks on the train. People wouldn't sit near us. They all sit well away. I yes. know you're working with Virgin on PC software. Yes. Any titles or...? Uh, a game called Ectosphere. Mm -hmm. There are a great many people out there who are emotionally disturbed. And uh, where do they see themselves when they go to the movies, they always see themselves as a villain who is ultimately has to be killed. This is very distressing for a lot of people. I have a friend who suffers from a mild form of schizophrenia and she, she enjoyed Cabal very much for that precise reason that she could see herself. Yeah, I think Stephen King said he's uh, not only delivers the goods, he is the goods. And so the word about him came before uh, the books arrived. And once the books of blood hit the shelves in the States, uh, it was pretty much a, opened the floodgates right there. I mean, it was, wow, this guy is great. You've got to read Clive Barker. Are there any generalizations you can give us about what strikes the people who become fanatical about your work? I'm using the vocabulary of religion. I'm using uh, good, evil, damnation, transcendence, uh, heaven and hell, and all its occupants, and saying, this is the world in which we we live, or this is the world in which my characters live, and therefore because the world that I'm describing, the world in which those characters are found at the beginning of those books is very similar to the world that you, the reader, are occupying, then these possibilities, good and bad, are just, just around the corner from you. 
I don't see a gate, Harvey said. That's because there isn't one. So how do we get in? Just keep walking. Half out of hunger, half out of curiosity, Harvey did as Richter's had instructed. And as he came within three steps of the wall, a gust of balmy, flower-scented wind slipped between the shimmering stones and kissed his cheek. Its warmth was welcome after his long, cold trek, and he picked up his pace, reaching out to touch the wall as he approached it. The misty stones seemed to reach for him in their turn, wrapping their soft, gray arms around his shoulders and ushering him through the wall. And ahead of him, set at the summit of a great slope, was a house that had surely first been imagined in a dream. In Weave World and Imagica and Thief of Always and in a lot of your books, there's the, the business of um, going through doors, going through walls, going into worlds which exist alongside dominions, they're sometimes called. It nearly always happens that when they go through these doors, they go through this world, they go to a sort of higher level of feeling, thinking, experiencing. Where does that come from? I think it comes from the experience of the imagination. I mean, I think that uh, the, again, to Blake, the idea that the imagination in us is, is, the, is evidence of the divine, uh, Jesus, the imagination, the, 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 the spiritual tool by which we can experiment with possibilities. I think that the uh, the kind of fiction I'm writing is metaphysical fiction. That is, it deals constantly with how it might be if our flesh was slightly different, how it might be if our spirits manifested themselves physically, how it might be if our bodies uh, and our minds were totally separated. That happens quite a lot. The mind takes a journey in the books very often separated from the body. Uh, the body is constantly transforming in the books. I mean, flesh in my fiction is protean. It, it sprouts, it bulges, it... it, it, it uh, Maidens it change into dragons and dragons change Exactly. Into... And in a way, that's a nice image of what I'm trying to say, that our imaginations are constantly transforming us uh, in our dream lives and even in our waking lives i mean in our relation to what we see in the mirror in our relation to what we choose to wear in the relationship to the way we present ourselves to the world it's a game of illusions and uh we kid ourselves in all the time about who we are what we are what we seem to be Making marks on a piece of paper, just letting it come, is the least intellectual of the, the arts that I'm involved in. I mean, I have to think very hard to, to structure a book. This stuff is very immediate, you know? It plugs into stuff which is uh, pretty deeply rooted in my psyche, so deeply in sense that some of these characters have been appearing on pieces of paper now for maybe 30 years in various incarnations. I think the thing that surprises me occasionally is how familiar I am with things which would normally fall under the, under the heading of subconscious material. I think uh, the wall, which is quite um, uh, strong and quite implacable in most people, between the subconscious and the conscious, in me is is, you know, it's got large holes in it. I think there's toings and froings constantly. And I only ever really basically paint human beings. And I usually paint people in some transformed state or other. Either they're on their way to being transformed or they are transformed. Uh, those subjects never lose their power to arouse us and distress us because the ongoing drama of the body is one that we meet in the mirror every morning. The oil paintings on this scale, at least, are a new departure for me. Uh, the last 18 months, maybe, I've been making paintings this large, and on occasion a little larger. Um, 
and exhibiting them in New York and Los Angeles. The pleasure for me, or one of the pleasures of making paintings, is that they are absolutely beyond the word. And I work so much with words, and I enjoy working with words. Uh, but it's a great pleasure to be liberated into a place where the word has no dominion. The most often asked question is, what, what kind of drugs do you use to do this stuff? And uh, I don't. I don't think I would be particularly empowered by the drug experience. Uh, I'm actually rather fearful of it. Um, uh, I suppose I'm a control freak when it comes to my imagination, and I, uh, I'm deeply suspicious of the guy who says, oh, well, I have to get drunk to write, or, you know, I only see visions when, I'm, when I've eaten mushrooms. Mm. Uh, the, the imaginative tool is in us all. You only have to go to a schoolyard and hear four-year-olds and five-year-olds playing and see that there isn't a kid in the schoolyard who doesn't have this vital thing blossoming, flowering in them all the time. What happens is that we get educated. And there's a lot of good things about education, but one of the bad things is that, that the capitalist system is preparing us for uh, a 40-hour week in which our imaginations must not be overstimulated. What, what effect do you think you're having on readers? Do you think imagination can really transform people's lives? And if so, in what way? You can only go from your own experience. My life has absolutely been transformed by the imaginative possibilities offered to me by artists. Isn't that one of the reasons why we go to books and paintings and, and theater and movies? We go because we want our lives enriched, and that enrichment is a kind of change. Uh, we want our pain illuminated, and if it's illuminated, maybe it isn't quite so terrible. I think my kind of fiction, and I get this in, in, in conversations with people and in letters, is, is to some extent about saying these journeys are journeys which, which we're all taking. And it's okay to take them. And it doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean you're marginalized. Uh, just because you're bringing your dreamscape into your daily life, into your conscious life, doesn't make you fit for the madhouse. Actually, it makes you very healthy. If I thought it was just a, uh, a throwaway, disposable form of, of entertainment and was, was going to distract people and then be forgotten, I would not be motivated to do it at all. I think I prefer to go and herd sheep. <laughs> Southbound show next Sunday at 10.15, the subject dawn.